Users of all technical backgrounds can find value in Foundry for many use cases. Yet at times, they are still responsible for writing readable and maintainable code. Foundry makes it very easy to get started with PySpark and data pipeline development, and that's a great boon for productivity. Yet in my many years of experience as a data engineer, I find that people fall into the same pitfalls time and time again. Not to worry though, it's very easy to avoid those traps once you know what you're looking out for. Join me for a cold review of a repository in the Foundry Reference Project, and I show you what I mean. To review a transform, we need to first understand the transform's intended purpose. To do so, we first look at the inputs and outputs. Here we have the primary input, which is a data set of flight instances, followed by a number of lookup tables, then airports and runways, which are used to enrich the main data set with foreign properties. The output is also a data set of flight instances, but cleaned up and enriched for optimal comprehension. To make for easier manipulation downstream, we parse out times into native PySpark timestamps. We do this by applying a couple of UGFs defined as closures. Finally, this last step does some denormalization by bringing in runway metadata directly to the flight rules, which is how downstream operations expect them to be. To start with the refactoring, I want to first improve this long line here. Long lines like these are bad for readability and make mistakes more likely to happen. Let's create a new branch and break up the line by taking advantage of implicit continuation by enclosing it in parentheses. Let's remove the linter suppression. Now, the linter is flagging that this line is using the union operation, which is considered an anti-pattern. We should use union by name instead, which provides a bit more safety by enforcing the column names line up correctly. Another thing we can improve here is how renaming takes place. Since the final name of this column we are assembling is going to be airport, we should use that directly for better clarity of intent. Notice how we even save up one line of code with this change. Next, I want to move these definitions down below where they are used. Code locality helps comprehension. Since these values are only used in a single place, there is no reason for them to be defined here separately. You may argue that this makes the local code more complex, which is true, but as the Zen of Python goes, explicit is better than implicit. This is an important operation, it creates our primary key, and we should make it extra clear what columns are being used for it and how. I will also move this line down below for similar code locality reasons. The next change I want to make is how this UGF is being declared. Using the decorator variation, makes UGF declarations more local and explicit. It also simplifies the code a bit. The same goes for the other UGF. Moving on to this segment, there are some style adjustments I strongly recommend. Use keyword arguments to make the general operation more readable and predictable. It also helps avoid common mistakes. People often forget that the default join type is an inner join, so it pays off to make it explicit. In the next line, I noticed that there are a couple of unnecessary casts. All this is doing is dropping some precision from the data, which is not going to help with the geolocation. Let's remove that step. Now back to the UGF's refactoring, I remember the need to fix some lines that are using the old names. Now back to the first UGF, I decided to move it out of the main transform body. Although this arguably reduces locality, it's a good trade-off in this case as it makes it clear that these UGFs have no dependencies on local variables, they are pure functions. It also declutters the main body of code a bit. There are some tweaks worth doing to their bodies. Here I'm applying a programming pattern called early return, which helps with code comprehension. There are also some redundant arguments, which once removed make the call fit in one line, otherwise this function looks fine. With the other one, I decided to change the more extensively. It's better to return null values instead of dummy values. With this change, the body becomes significantly simpler. This doesn't change the overall behavior of the transform, as the dummy values were just ignored, same as those. Next thing I want to change is this segment. It's essentially doing a convoluted standing for a joint operation. It sends all the data to the driver, 
in the form of a pandas data frame, and then converts that into a map column, which essentially broadcasts the same data back to Spark. At this scale, it doesn't impact performance too much, but it's not good practice, and honestly, it's a bit hard to understand. So let's replace it all with a couple of joins, which are easier to comprehend. First, I'm creating a mapping data frame from the origin airports. It's just the airports data frame with some columns renamed. Joining into this with the right key is equivalent to mapping values. Notice how the resulting code is simpler and more straightforward. We can do the same for the destination airports. In these next lines, I'm also tweaking the join syntax to make them more explicit. Then I'm moving this whole block to the return statement, as there is no reason for it to be separate. This is an optional step. There are different schools of thought when it comes to long chains of operations like these, but I personally prefer to indicate logical segments by using white space rather than break up the chains into separate segments. This makes the code more declarative and the data flow more explicit. But the important part is keeping related code together and chaining is just one way to achieve that. All right, this code's already looking much more friendly. Next, I'll tweak how runways is joined to the main data frame. There is an unnecessary name prior to the join. It's good practice to use natural joins when possible as it avoids creating duplicated columns in the resulting data frame. The delay group joins can also be simplified a bit. In general, it's good practice to clean up data frames prior to joining them to others, not afterwards. This is good for locality, as it is harder after joins to follow which columns come from which data frame. Back to the top, first I'm removing some imports that are no longer necessary, then removing the Spark profile override. I did some testing of screen and verified that the default amount of executor memory is more than sufficient for this transform, as long as we allow Spark to use broadcast joins. Since this method is disabled on this stack by default, I'm asking Spark to use it explicitly by adding hints to the secondary data frames we're joining into the main one. Note that this only works as long as the broadcasted data frames are fairly small, which is the case here since they are effectively just lookup tables. And we're pretty much done with the adjustments to improve this transform. Now, I'm running preview to test the code. Looks like there's a problem at line 30. Looking closely, the issue is clear. The alias is not being applied on the column, it's on the data frame itself. This worked originally by coincidence because we are using a straight union instead of a union by name, and since there was just one column, the names didn't actually matter. But the code was incorrect all along. It's an easy fix. Great, now that preview worked, we can run a full build for further validation. The build completed and the data looks fine. But I'd like to point out a few other things in this transform that should be considered code smells. First one is the use of drop in A. Used like this, it will drop any rows that have a no in any column. Even though we are only using a few columns from the original data frame, this line will cause the unused columns to also interfere with our output. This can lead to unpredictable and hard to debug issues. Also, down here, I recommend against using few NA. Nodes are generally a better indicator for missing values with better semantics in Spark operators. Finally, this concat approach to construct the primary key is rather brittle. Any nodes in one of the columns will cause the entire expression to evaluate a null, which will lead to uniqueness issues. I won't touch these entire patterns, as it would cause a semantic break in the transform's output and possibly lead to issues downstream, but it's worth keeping these problems in mind when designing the transforms. That's it for now. I hope this has given you some idea of how my fellow data engineers and I maintain a high standard for our transforms code. It's all about keeping the code explicit, contextual, and readable. And there's a few tricks that help with all that. Only practice makes perfect, but this should be a good starting point. Happy transforming!